executed properly, that the bill may be halted to ensure local, state, and or federal rules and regulations are adhered to. All right, so I've given my preamble, I've given the questions that for both sides, and, and, and overlay to this analysis, of course, is the traditional TRO analysis. So I would like you to also talk about your right to relief and the immediacy of any harm as a subcomponent of the second issue there, I'd like you to address uh, the likelihood of prevailing on the merits. All right, so uh, I've given a preamble, I've read the, the moving papers. Now, I engage in, let's talk about how much time you need. And what I'd like to do, uh, I'd like to give you time that's unobstructed. Of course, lawyers like to object uh, during the trial but here, I'd rather, this is TRO. So it's more important that I hear and understand. So we sort of revert back to the rules that we learned, uh, perhaps in a, a primary school grade. I'm gonna give you the microphone, let you finish. Then I'm gonna give you the microphone, let you finish. Hopefully we can pull that off, all right? So again, having read this, I'm willing to give you about, I think the 20 to 30 minutes of peace should allow you to cover my questions and your regular argument. What do you think, uh, Mr. Schwartz? I think that sounds reasonable, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Bloom, what do you think? 30 minutes is fine, sir. All right, we're ready to go then. Now I'm going to be quiet. Mr. Schwartz, you have the microphone. Thank you, Your Honor. And I I'd like to just go down the questions you asked and try and address those. Make sure, is that, is that uh, microphone, does it have a green light at the bottom of it? It does. All right. Just pull it a little closer to you. Use your outside voice if you have to. That's what my mother used to tell me. Go ahead. Can, can I take my mask off? Uh, I'm just trying to speak a little louder. Okay. Can yes, you sir. hear me okay? Yes, sir, I can. Okay. The land is owned by the city of Atlanta. And yes, they are a governmental entity. In terms of whether this is a zoning or a permit issue, it's a permitting issue, but the permit requirement that we rely on is in the zoning ordinance. But what that requirement states is that it requires a land development permit to alter land. Well, they refer to a development permit, but then in the zoning code, the, well, the zoning ordinance, they refer to it, it's chapter 27 of the DeKalb County Code. And Although that regulates zoning, it also regulates building. And what we're relying on is a section regulating building. It's not a zoning decision, and the definition of zoning decision is in the zoning procedures law. I, I think that's 36, 33, 4, around there, whatever the definition section of that is. Or, um, so, And the requirements of the permit are that the, that the director of planning sustainability for DeKalb County shall not issue a permit that will violate any laws of the county or state. And what we're alleging is that the development will violate state law. And I'll, I'll address that further. Uh, and the statute that covers runoff is the Georgia Water Quality Control Act, which is it's a delegated program from the uh, federal government under the Clean Water Act, and I'll, I'll discuss how that works. Uh, and in answer to your question about whether we concede that, and I didn't catch this, um, the fourth word, you said, do we concede that, uh, that a state or blank entity is exact? I'll repeat it. If this is a permitting issue, do you concede that even a state or federal government project serving a legitimate government interest is still bound by permitting regulations, i.e. electrical inspections, sewage inspections, <coughs> structural inspections, and until those are executed properly, that the bill may be halted to ensure local, state, and or federal rules and regulations are adhered to? So your Honor, what I, uh, what I can address on that is not specifically state or federal because that's not an issue here so much as except to the extent that state and county would be 
the same, which in a lot of places they are. Um, the case that addresses that is City of Decatur versus DeKalb County, where the county. Your citation. Uh, bear with me a moment. Your Honor, that's 256 Georgia Appeals 46. And the, the county was building the courthouse, the, and the, the city was uh, trying to enforce its zoning and building regulations. And what the court found was that the county is exempt from zoning regulations, but they are not exempt from building regulations. However, the reason for that is does not apply to municipalities. And the, the reason it, um, that they're looking at that in part is Well, the, the portion about being able to apply the, um, the zoning, I, I mean the building regulations, uh, they refer to that a municipal, municipality is imbued with the task of enforcing its supplementary powers within its own boundaries. And that's what we're missing here. This is not within the city of Atlanta. It is in unincorporated DeKalb County. So the other thing that they look at when they're talking about uh, enforcement of zoning regulations, because that's dealing with the building regulations, but enforcement of zoning regulations is that the county has a supremacy or uh, it's a, their, what they want to do is uh, preempt the municipal decision. And so, and another case on that that addresses the, um, the distinction between the, the, the power that counties or state have, or also the uh, like authorities that are imbued with the same powers as the county or state, would be uh, Macon Bibb, let me get a site here, it's Macon Bibb County Hospital Authority versus Madison at 204 Georgia Appeal 741. And, but, but we're dealing with the converse of that here. This is a city outside its boundaries and the question is, is, are they required to comply with zoning uh, or, or building regulations? And the, there's no cases that I'm aware of or that, that I have seen the, uh, def the defendant cite that would say that a municipality is exempt from zoning in another, uh, in, in another town or county. Let me ask you a question. This is, uh, I'm going to make sure, is this a correct pronunciation of law from your perspective? County buildings are not subject to city zoning ordinances, but buildings are not exempt from compliance with other city building regulations. Is that a true pronouncement of law? Yes, and I think that's from City of Decatur versus DeKalb County. But the point that is important to note here is we're not dealing with a county being subject to municipal regulation. We're dealing with a municipality being subject to county regulations. So the, the supremacy does not apply. And I can, the, um, the police foundation filed a brief today around 1245 addressing, uh, contending that the county is exempt from municipal. I did not have an opportunity to review all the cases that they cited. But the first two I looked at, they don't apply. And I can just pull that up and explain um, why. So the first one, was Evans versus Just Open Government at 242 Georgia 834. And what it says is a state-owned government property, um, whether acquired by uh, through sale or eminent domain proceedings, is not subject to local zoning ordinances. And what they talk about is if you have the power of eminent domain, then you necessarily have the power to be exempt from zoning, not building, but zoning. Now, the city of Atlanta does not have the power of eminent domain outside their boundaries. And there's, and then, so the next uh, case that they cited was a mayor 
of Savannah versus Collins, 211, Georgia 191. And here, the municipality had uh, the right to condemn property. It was for a firehouse. And therefore, if they had the right to condemn property, they also had the right to be exempt from zoning and could put a, fireplace, a firehouse where they wanted. It's just not an issue here. And um, what, the, what the county code states is that the, z um, the zoning rules apply to all property within unincorporated DeKalb. Now, presumably, if DeKalb wanted to do something, they would be able to because they have the power of eminent domain. But um, it, it, besides for the fact that the, um, that the ordinance says that it applies to all property, what it says is government facilities are a permitted use in every zoning category in the, in the county, but it doesn't mean that government facilities are exempt from either um, zoning regulations or building regulations. And w when we're talking about a municipality that's outside the boundaries, it's just there's no cases that I've seen that hold that or that they've cited. And otherwise, a city could go anywhere in the state and just do whatever they want. And it just is unheard of. So, and, and I would like to raise one issue because um, in one of the cases they cited today, and I'm not sure which one, but it was, um, I, I could find it if needed, but it was citing to OCGA 36-30-3. And what that states is that one council cannot bind future councils from free legislation. There is an exception, well there's a couple of exceptions, and the one exception that I think the city maybe expected might apply here was for at least no greater than 50 years for public justice purposes, and, but it, within the downtown development area of within the municipality's geographic area. That's not the exact phrase, but I could give you the exact phrase. Now, we're not raising that in our ZBA appeal. If that were to be raised, it would be by a city of Atlanta taxpayer in, um, in Fulton County Superior Court. But the point is, is, for this court, if it's weighing the public interest in terms of granting or denying an injunction, it would be, it would favor, this statute that was cited today by the Police Foundation would favor granting a preliminary injunction in TRO because what this statute says is that, well, it, well, it says what I just told you, but what it means is what the courts have said is if you enter, if a municipality enters into a contract in violation of that statute, it's void. It doesn't matter if the other party has, has tried to reasonably uh, take steps to rely on the contract because the municipality had no power to enter into that. And when you look at OCGA 3630-3 and you look at the language of section A, it's very clear that it refers to within the downtown development area with, uh, within the city municipal limits. And that's actually not A. A is what says they can't enter into legisl legislation that binds free, uh, restricts future councils from free legislation. But then when you look at the exceptions, what it refers to in this exception is that uh, that it has to be within the municipal boundaries. So, Are you conceding, Mr. Schwartz, that the uh, plaintiffs have an adequate remedy at law at this time? No, we do not have an adequate remedy because the remedy that we were provided by law to stop the clearing is the administrative appeal in the Zoning Board of Appeals in DeKalb County. We filed that. Um, Amy Taylor, so I represent Amy Taylor, um, South River Watershed Alliance, Ted Terry, and, and Carolyn Tucker, who is a resident of Boulder Wall. No, well, I guess what I was suggesting, you referenced this appeal process earlier in your comments. I made a mental note. Isn't that an adequate remedy at law for you? It's, it, it should have been, but it's not. And the reason it's not is because what that, um, what that the DeKalb County Zoning Ordinance states is that for residentially zoned properties, the appeal stays the permit so that there can be no construction or alteration of land 
until the ZBA issues a decision. Okay, and what happened was we filed the appeal the same day that the police foundation started clearing and they have not stopped clearing and the county has not issued a stop work order. It's virtually unheard of that, that someone would just work through a stay during an administrative appeal. And so we have no remedy to stop that other than in equity. And what, um, one of the issues that the Police Foundation raised in their brief today is saying that we don't have a standalone claim and that injunctive relief uh, cannot stand on its own. But our, 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 we have a legal right under the law to the construction to stop. If, if you look at uh, Chapter 27, uh, Code Section 7.5.2, it specifically refers to staying for residentially zoned property. It's undisputed this is residentially zoned. Okay, it's R75, and that's in our Exhibit 1, it's the, um, the survey sheet. Now, the, um, and, and to the point of whether the court cannot hear a request for injunction while there's an administrative appeal uh, pending, which is an issue raised today by the Police Foundation, the, the code section itself refutes that because what it says is for residentially zoned property, the appeal stays construction until the decision is issued. For non-residentially zoned property, the, um, the uh, appellant would have to go into a court of competent jurisdiction to request an injunction. And so it very expressly contemplates that a, an appellant could seek an injunction to stop and we're just asking this court to actually apply the law that's already um, there. What's so, your best case on point for that? that basically, you've gone through this BZA process, they ruled against your client initially, you no. work, work for reverse, you appealed. So I'm sorry, Your Honor, there was never any judicial decision or quasi-judicial decision. What, what happened was the permit was issued by the, the administrative agency. And so it's a land development permit, and there's a 15-day period to appeal. And what this, appeal. Yes, and what the code states is that um, the Zoning Board of Appeals has the power and duty to hear any appeal, uh, um, to hear an appeal um, where there's error alleged in any decision of an administrative official. And what it then states is who has that right to file the appeal. And it states it can be filed by any property owner who lives within 250 feet of the subject site, which Amy Taylor does. And it also states it can be filed by any elected member of the DeKalb uh, Governing Authority, which Commissioner Ted Terry is. So they're both appellants. The, so we don't need a case um, to, to apply that. The code is expressed. It's unambiguous. There's no ambiguity in it. And it, it, it's, it's it, it, we're just asking this court to enforce that. And so I would like to address the merits of our appeal, but what I would also like your honor to understand is that it shouldn't be necessary for this court to even um, determine whether we have a substantial likelihood of prevailing on the merits of the appeal. What, what, should, what, the, um, what the reference should be for likelihood of success is whether the stay already applies. That's what we're alleging here. And what's your best authority for that? I don't have any case for it, but, um, and, and I think that when you hear the argument on the Clean Water Act issues and the Georgia Water Quality Control, it, it, um, you can understand why we have a substantial likelihood of prevailing on the merits of that claim. But the point is, is otherwise, if, if it were otherwise, the, um, anyone who has a permit um, and that, that gets stayed could just ignore it um, and, and make the appellate prove the merits of their case immediately instead of at a hearing. It's just not how it works. So if you look at 7.5.2, it just it can't be any other interpretation. Of, and they're not, you know, they're not saying the, that, you know, th that there's not a stay. What they're, um, wh well, what they're arguing is, is that it doesn't apply to municipalities. Um, but first of all, what they're, 
It, well, as I stated before, it just, that, that, um, that argument falls flat when you're dealing with a municipality within an unincorporated county and outside of its own boundaries. It's just there's no case to, um, to, to support that position for, on their side. Um, all right, so then I think the last question, all right, so then you had questions about um, the immediacy of the harm. I would like to just explain um, about this site. This site is 296 acres. It's what um, used to be the old Atlanta prison farm. It's a, it's a site that's eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. And in 2017, the city planning department uh, undertook a um, planning report to guide the city's future land use. And in there, they, um, the city proposed two new urban parks. Um, and they, what they talked about with this uh, South River Park was creating 1,200 acre in-town urban park, which they said would, this would be our last opportunity to save this area and create a massive new urban park. And just to put that in context, Piedmont Park is about 200 acres. They're talking about creating a 1,200 acre park here and the central part of that in this planning document was this old Atlanta prison farm. And the city actually in 2017 adopted this, uh, the design plan report, um, it's called Atlanta City Design, into the city charter. Again, virtually unheard of that a municipality adopts a planning document like that into its city charter. Now, the planning document is not binding but it set the expectation of a community that has been continually polluted and disinvested from that this would be a, um, a new urban park and there's a lot of community planning that went into creating this. And, um, it will, it, it, and the, um, this particular site, so it's, it's 300 acres, and they are, um, it, it had been open to the public and it, um, it has been, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, contrary to some of the statements made by the city, it is, you know, large parts of this are wooded. Uh, there are, there's lakes, and um, I would like to, in a moment, show you some pictures, but I think you've seen them in the briefs that we fought. Um, they are clearing 85 acres of it, and so it is um, a loss of, Habitat. There's wildlife around there, and it's also the the clearing is adversely impacting the uh, entrenchment creek for sediment, and that is the merits of our case in the ZBA. Now, again, I don't think that uh, you need to find that we have a, a likelihood of prevailing on this to just enforce what they're already required to comply with because that's the distinction here. Normally, if someone's asking for a uh, temporary restraining order, well, sometimes they are asking for something that's already required to be done, but other times it's just they're, they're making a claim that, um, that's, you know, that they might have harm and trying to stop it to preserve the status quo, which is, which is fine. That's a, a, a good reason to grant a temporary restraining order preliminary injunction to preserve the status quo. But there are other times when courts are authorized to grant a, a preliminary injunction or temporary restraining order without even showing irreparable harm, such as when their covenants are uh, being violated. And here, w what we have is a similar situation because it's just a very plain statute that they're subject to a stay that they're not complying with. But the, the merits of our Clean Water Act claim and State uh, Water Quality Control Act is um, that the Clean Water Act requires states to identify surface streams uh, and lakes with, um, that are not meeting a designated use. So um, what that means is that every, um, every state has to identify a designated use for each of the surface waters in their state. And so the designated use for Entrenchment Creek is fishing, which includes the protection of aquatic life. And if the State Environmental Protection Division determines that the stream is not meeting its designated use, then the state is required to come up with what's called a total maximum daily load, 
where they come up with a, a budget for whatever the pollutant is. Here, it's sediment. So the state came up with a, um, a budget for sediment. This was in 2017. First in 20, 2007, they came up with a, a estimate, uh, a, a, an allowable annual sediment load of 330 tons into Entrenchment Creek of sediment. There was quite a lot of, of paperwork about these uh, uh, erosion issues. Of, is that appropriate? Is that proper for a TRO study? Absolutely, Your Honor. Th this is irreparable, not just from clearing the trees, uh, and, um, but also that if the more if, if, if sediment is allowed to go into Entrenchment Creek without um, without it, it should not be, and I will, I will continue on to explain why. But it's it's a type of pollutant that accumulates, and um, because of the sediment that's already there, there um, the state has determined it's in very poor health and it's not supporting aquatic life. So um, the sediment smothers the fish beds. Um, it, it, it doesn't give an opportunity for fish and macroinvertebrates, and it's the, and the, so the Clean Water Act has uh, kind of two primary components in terms of how to um, avoid pollution or to get a polluted area back. Let me ask you, would this permitting process be a better venue to have these uh, expert issues uh, sort of hashed out? I mean, I looked at, there was an extensive bit of uh, information about the federal regulations about sediment, and uh, you mentioned the uh, health, current health of this uh, area. Wouldn't, wouldn't the permitting process, the zoning process, the local process be a better place to hash these issues out? So it's one place to hash it out, and we will have an opportunity to address the merits of this, but the site's going to be cleared by the time we have a hearing there if a TRO is denied. And the, the point is, is that- How do you know that? Because, um, or, or even if it's not, um, the whole, even if not the whole thing is cleared, they will continue to clear, and they don't have authorization under Section 7.5.2 of Chapter 27. That, that's the key here. If you look at Chapter 27, 7.5.2, and it's cited in our brief, the, the filing of the appeal suspends the authorization. The, they don't have a permit to do this, and all we're asking for you to do is enforce that stay. And that's just what the law requires. It has nothing to do with the Clean Water Act or whether it's uh, you know any other requirement of the of the county code? It's just the, it's it's you know, and it's not it's not the police foundation's place to make uh, determine whether that's a good or bad idea to have a stay. And respectfully, it's 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 not necessarily a superior court's um, uh, you know policy decision to make. It's something that the um, DeKalb County Board of Commissioners has already made. Is, isn't your argument premised largely on? Uh, a predictive harm, which is prospective in nature, it's almost no. Okay, why not? Okay, and this gets back to just explaining the um, the background of the Clean Water Act, and I, I'll try and get to it quickly. But essentially, when you have a polluted stream, they come up with a budget. For this stream, the budget is 945 tons per year. There is a state regulation and a federal regulation that says. For, um, you cannot issue a permit to a new discharger uh, into an impaired stream or within one mile above a pair, impaired stream uh, if there is a waste load allocation, which there is here, it's 945 tons, unless if there is remaining pollutant allocations. There has to be something left, okay? And, and so I, I read all that in, in the movie papers. I guess I'm asking a simpler question. It's not let me, predictive. Let me, let me ask a question. Uh, the harm that you are referencing is, actually, is predictive in nature. In, in other words, the harm hasn't occurred yet. You just believe that if you're not granted this TRO, that this is the harm that will occur, will make this, uh, this area, this water area, even worse. Is that right? It's not, Your Honor, and okay. I'd like to explain why, and, and this is explained in the affidavit of Greg Hubbard, uh, which is at, I think, uh, page 592 of, um, no, it's, well, it's, it's not at the page, it's the affidavit of Greg Hubbard that we filed today. Okay. And the, the reason is this, okay, the, there is zero 
allocation left um, within Entrenchment Creek. When they create, when EPD created this annual sediment budget, they allocated 300 and some tons to non-point source runoff and the other 600 tons to the municipal storm sewer system. It's already been allocated. There's none left. So what, what's going to happen here is, and um, what the state- but isn't your verb telling you this ain't going to happen? You're talking no, about predictive harm. It's not predictive because the permit allows it. The general permit, okay, so the Georgia Water Quality Control Act requires a permit to discharge um, pollutants, okay? And for any construction site that in, involves at least one acre of clearing, um, you're covered under a general permit. You don't have to actually get an individual permit. EPD doesn't review the site-specific details necessarily, but you, the, the um, applicant submits a notice of intent to clear the site. 14 days later, unless if they're notified to the contrary, they're authorized under the permit. And what the permit allows is it allows um, discharges as long as they are in compliance with certain erosion control best management practices, then they can discharge up to um, 50 NTU, okay, so the permit allows sediment discharge. It's not predictive, and if you look at um, Mr. Hubbard's affidavit at page, um, at, um, I'll, I'll have to pick up the page, but it's only a three-page affidavit, but what he refers to is that on sheet nine of phase three for the erosion control, there's over an acre of this property that actually bypasses the detention ponds and discharges directly into the creek. So it's not predictive, it's absolutely certain that they are intending to discharge sediment into the creek. Now, if the creek wasn't polluted, there would not be a problem with that. But because Entrenchment Creek is polluted, there, and, and it's not just that it's polluted, the significant part is that the budget for sediment has already been entirely allocated. And what might happen in sometimes if it's already been allocated and other, a new discharger comes along, a state might try and reallocate. Well, I'll give you a, a few questions, so I'm giving you some latitude, but you, you're at your time, we'll give you about four more minutes. Okay. Um, I, um, if here they cannot reallocate the existing budget because, so the state determined 945 times is the maximum that it can receive and come back to meeting water quality standards, which is required by state and federal law. Here, what happened was after the city, um, af after Entrenchment Creek was listed as impaired, EPD waived the sediment limits for um, the two um, sewage overflow facilities that are on Entrenchment Creek. They discharged right into Entrenchment Creek. The city's report from 2017 that they submitted um, for the watershed improvement plan stated that the um, average annual sediment concentration from those two facilities was um, over 12,000 tons. Okay, so, so there, you know, there's no extra room here, but not only is there no extra room, they're so far over it, it just is illegal under the Clean Water Act. And the point is, is that this site can go somewhere else, but it's illegal to put it on Entrenchment Creek, and it's illegal to continue clearing while there's no authorized permit. And we're just asking the court to enforce that stay so we can have an opportunity for the proper forum to listen to the merits of our claim and decide whether this is allowed or not. All right. Any, any uh, final um, comments? I would just ask that uh, you enforce the existing law. It's very clear that they're um, they're not allowed to stay while an appeal is pending on uh, residentially zoned property. And I appreciate your consideration, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Bloom. Yes, sir. May it please the court, uh, my name is Simon Bloom, and as I mentioned in announcements, I have the honor and privilege of representing both the Atlanta Police Foundation and the city of Atlanta, um, an interested party in the matter. As stated, the city does own the, the subject property, and I am counsel for the city as well. It's my honor and privilege because we have before us an attempt to stop what is the most significant government real estate project in the history of the state of Georgia since Hartsfield Airport. 
This is not some lark for a mobile home park or some subdivision with 50 lots. This is one of the most significant governmental projects that will be done in this state in our lifetime. It will have impact that far exceeds those of us that are in the room. And that is particularly relevant when one considers that one of the elements in considering a TRO is public interest, and it is the balancing of the harms. Your Honor has been through too many rodeos in that chair, I suspect, to believe that this entire song and dance is about silt in the creek. This is simply an effort to block this project. All other efforts have failed. This is the latest chapter of that book. More lawsuits will come, there is no question. Is Mr. Schwartz, is, I mean, the strength of his argument is that this ordinance, uh, the appeal of the permit, causes an automatic stay. Well, what's your response to that? Because that appears to be the strength of his argument. You're right, and I'm going to knock that straw man down right out of the gate. So rather than me go into my, my uh, illustrative presentation, let's just get the grist for the mill out of the way. Your Honor, we provided to Mr. Mr. Smith um, a bench brief on this topic that contains the case law that you were asking Mr. Schwartz about. If you've got it, I'm not going to bother you with another copy. I have your bench brief. Okay. So th this, is the, this is the bench brief that's entitled, The Property is Exempt from the Zoning Ordinance's Stay Provision. So here's the question. Your Honor asked whether this is a zoning issue. It is a zoning issue because the provision that gives the stay during the pendency of an LDP appeal is a zoning ordinance. That is where the stay language comes from. If we as a municipal corporation, as a unit of the state, as a governmental entity, are exempt from zoning codes, then we are exempt from the code that says there must be a stay. It is that simple. We don't have to go any further than that. It is undisputed, it is irrefutable that the code section they rely on, the section 7.5.2, 7.5.2 in chapter 27, is a zoning ordinance. It is part of the county's zoning code. If we are exempt from the zoning code, we are exempt from the state provision. Let's sit on this issue of why we're exempt for a minute, because Your Honor asked the right questions on this topic. Mind you, I'm saying it's the strongest argument he has, but I ain't saying it's strong. I'm just going to the top argument first because that's what Your Honor asked me to do. We don't get to that discussion for a number of reasons that I'm going to come back around to, but I understand it's on Your Honor's mind. And so I want to explore it some more. First of all, what you heard in terms of the mayor, the mayor of Savannah case, it's the Collins case. You also heard reference to the Evans case. You've heard reference to the city of Decatur case. The importance of these cases, judges, is as follows. There is a constitutional and legislative policy in this state which creates a comity of governmental entities. That means you county can't hold me to your zoning code and me city can't hold county to the zoning code. And none of us can hold the state or the state agencies to the zoning code. That is black letter law. When your honor looks at these cases contained in my bench brief, I submit that you will arrive at the same conclusion that I have which is a unit of the state formed and created by the state where the state legislature empowered by the Georgia Constitution has created a municipal corporation that's called the city of Atlanta is a unit of the state and it is undisputed that a unit of the state cannot be bound by zoning codes. Let me, I, and I, maybe this is a distinction without meaning, but actually I, I, I gather municipalities are charter entities that have received their grant of charter from the legislature. Correct. So insofar as their state government, back to the old, what they call the old system here in Georgia, the state government is a unit system, the, the county is part of state government, uh, but tell me why the cities are automatically a part of the state government. The preface to your question helps to answer it. The, the incorporation of a municipality is the first step of creating it as a state unit. The way the law talks about counties is they talk about counties as subdivisions of the state. That may be the law that you're thinking of, Your Honor. When you get to a city, a municipality, pick one. We've had a lot of them created in the last 10 years. But pick one that is right. The legislator has the authority from the Georgia Constitution to create that entity. And then you need look only as far as um, a, a rather recent case, a 2019 case out of the Supreme Court of Georgia, 
which is 306 Georgia 301. It's the city of College Park versus Clayton County. 306 Georgia 301? Yes, sir. That case is, oh, it, one yes, sir. Short, short, 301. Yes, your honor. That's a 20. City of College Park versus Clayton County. Correct, your honor. That's a, that is a 2019 case opinion written by the chief at that time, Justice Melton. One of the core and threshold issues of this case, and it was a, it was a fight between the city and the, and the county, um, was whether the, whether the, the, the county governmental regulations and immunity governed or pre-terminated that immunity for the city. So I would direct the court to page 304. And in particular, Justice Melton, the chief writes, there are several issues in this case, but we will start with the broadest and perhaps most important consideration whether sovereign immunity applies at all to this suit between the city and the county to political subdivisions of the sovereign state of Georgia. So there we have a pronouncement by Je Chief Justice Melton three years ago where he identifies and recognizes that cities and counties are co-equals in the eyes of state law. And in particular, in that context, it had to do with sovereign immunity. Mr. Bloom, what would you say to the, uh, I guess, the legal view that that is, is dictum, not, not a uh, black letter, but it's, it's dictum. Well, it's not dictum in this case. It, it's not dictum in the College Park case. It is, Melton says it right out of the gate. This is the core issue. We will start, there are several issues in this case, but we'll start with the broadest and most important. So he's making that the premier issue in this case, in the College Park case. So I, I would submit that it is by no means dictum. It is the foundation upon which he made this ruling and I believe it was a unanimous, unanimous uh, decision in the end. But I would ask the court to consider that because it is that comedy concept that equates the city's protection from local zoning codes to the same protection that a state would have, to the same protection that a county would have, to the same protection the Department of Corrections would have, same protection that any agency of the state would have, being exempt from local zoning ordinances. That knocks this issue flat on its ear and takes them out of what they continue to rely upon, which is that there's some automatic stay that's in place because the property is residentially zoned. The code, it, the DeKalb code says what he says it said. It's in my bench brief, you'll see it. We don't dispute the, the words on the page. We're just simply not governed by them. You asked a very important question earlier, which I think touches upon this, which is what's the difference between permitting and zoning? Well. The permitting process in the development code of DeKalb County, we are beholden to. And it's a different animal. Zoning says what you can do with the property. Development code says how you can horizontally develop it. Building code says how you can go vertical on it. Three different codes. And I'm here to tell you that the ordinance that they rely on for the stay, the automatic stay, is in the zoning code of DeKalb County. And as a result, since we're exempt from it, it doesn't apply to us. I would direct your honor as well to page 311 um, where, where Justice Melton is talking about the same concept. He says, put in the simplest terms, put in the simplest of terms in this case, the county is not sovereign over the city and the city is not a sovereign over the county. Neither retains a superior authority over the other that would prevent it from being hailed into a court of law by the other. There couldn't be a clearer pronouncement of the comedy concept that I introduced to the court five minutes ago than what Justice Melton has identified. Have I exhausted that issue for your honor? I think it, it uh, answers the question, yes. I'm not asking you to agree with me. I'm just asking you whether I've answered the question. Yeah, I think you've answered the question. Uh, what about, uh, let's say, state, if the state had regulations regarding uh, how electricity is to be provided to end users in a let's say a municipality, are you saying that, the state, that a government entity could say, ah, we, we don't have to abide by that, we can, we can use our own standards to determine uh, how electricity is to be provided in this uh, governmental building, uh, regardless of the fact that everybody else has to abide by a different set of standards? I don't think that the owner, whether it be, well, whoever the owner of the dirt is, city, state, agency, county, I don't think that that owner would be exempt from that scenario. I think that what the cases say and what I've just explicated, expounded on is that in terms of zoning codes, 
I, I'm not biting off more than I can chew with this. I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident and comfortable with the position that it is, as long as we're talking about zoning codes, that cities, counties, states, and their agencies and units are exempt from the others. Um, so, Judge, I think well, that, I yes, sir. it's appropriate to, you know, Mr. Schwartz's argument that, you know, while this, is, while this appeal is pending, if you all clear this land, it's going gonna, it's gonna to exacerbate this sediment problem. So ultimately, that's going to, I gather, increase the uh, current harm and may, let's say, for instance, if there was an irreparable tipping point, let's say the irreparable tipping point could occur and, you know, they could ultimately prevail in their appeal, but the river or this water area would be ruined. What do you say to that? You said it better than I could. Predictive harm. You said it much better than I could have said it. If you look at the actual plat, pull up exhibit 12. If you look, can we share the screen? Share yes, screen please, Your Honor. If you, if you, if you pull up the, the actual conceptual site plan and, uh, and project for, uh, map for this, you'll see, and I don't want to dig too deep in here because I, I have limited time, but if you're interested in it, the, the predictive harm is so, te so tenuous and, and, so ex and so distant. First of all, it is primarily based on the assumption, which is incorrect according to the experts. According to the EPD, let's talk about that for a second. We apply for an LDP. We're going to disturb more than 50 acres, so the, our application has to go up to EPD, the authority on the Clean Water Act. EPD looks at our application, sees that we're going to disturb 85 acres. Not once, but twice, it reviews our plan for disturbing these 85 acres. And not once, but twice, it says, you're good to go. It says, no, Mr. Schwartz, this impaired creek is not at the max. No, Mr. Schwartz, these guys can add more silt to the creek if they do, but they can. And by the way, APF, you've got to do four additional BMPs, best management practices, safeguards, to try to in ensure that as little silt gets off the site as possible. When you look at the 85 acres, it's basically, Your Honor, can see the transmission easement, Georgia Power's transmission easement that goes right through the middle of it, kind of that, that swath. Sort of, sort of describe what you're talking about on this picture. I see it, but I, I, don't, I don't have an orientation. No, I'm with you. Um, you've got Constitution Road is the southern boundary of the subject property. All of the light green that's been colored that is bound by Constitution to the south, Key Road to the west, and it touches Boulder Crest to the northeast. But just the bright green um, is the subject property. It's roughly 300 acres. The only development activity is occurring to the left of the transmission easement. And only 85 acres of that 170 acres is being disturbed, period. So we're talking about 85 acres of the 171 to the left of the transmission easement. You can see- Where's the water here? Uh, right. Yes, you, right on there. So if you go back into the trees to the east, to the right, you can see, can you blow that up a little bit, just the creek? You can see the creek that is running from north to south from Key Road this subdivision up here in the right corner, this key road subdivision down through the trees to the south. Do you see that, Judge? Yes, okay. So you don't need to be an EPD expert to see the extent to which, and at least sheet flow, like water just flowing on the ground, would would carry silt all the way over to this creek. I mean, I'm no expert, but that's pretty common sense. I've tried plenty of these runoff cases, and that's one of the first things that jurors want to know. You asked the right question earlier. Is this the right time to be trying to adjudicate whether this predictive harm will actually take place? What I can tell you is, if you want to, EPD has said twice, and now they've said it a third time. Because we've provided the court with an affidavit from Anna Trzinski, who is the chief of the chief of something with a lot of letters behind her name that is the boss of the people that make these decisions in the field. And Ms. Trzinski, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly, testifies in her affidavit that she reviewed the work of Mr. Boutel, who issued those two letters in July and April of 2022, that said this project was good to go. She reviewed that, and she created an affidavit that says they were right, that number one, plaintiff is wrong, there is room in this creek to add additional silt, and number two, if you're gonna do development and, and disturb the 85 acres, you've gotta not only do the normal safeguards, but you've got to add four more. 
which we've agreed to do, and that's no problem. So the harm that they think might happen is so speculative that I want to get to the question that should be foremost on your honor's mind, which is the balancing test. Your honor is charged under Georgia law with balancing the harms. We learned this in law school. We took it at the bar. It is a fundamental question. First, is there an adequate remedy at law? Your, your honor answered that question. The answer is a, a resounding yes. They're doing it. They're in the middle of the adequate remedy at law. They've appealed the issuance of the stop or of the land disturbance permit to the county. The county has a code section that says you can appeal within 15 days to ZBA. The, BZ, the ZBA makes a decision. You can appeal that. But if, if you were, if your client was inclined to, uh, because there's an appeal pending, go ahead and maximize clearing, wouldn't this be the ideal time to do that? So that regardless of the decision of this appeal, this land is cleared either way. County would never, ever, ever let us do that. Here's how that works. Step one, before you move the first piece of dirt or cut down the first tree, there is a set of safeguards that you have to install on the, on the 85 acres, which you probably have seen as silt fence, as an example. Two rows of thousands of linear feet of silt fence have to be installed, double road, et cetera. That's an example of one of those safeguards. And you have to phase the development clearing process very carefully, Judge, consistent with your sediment and erosion control plan, which is what you get approved when you apply for an LDP. That's the whole core of the LDP. But, but if you exceeded your sediment and erosion plan, what's the remedy? Oh, you got to go back and put that dirt back. you got to put those trees back. It's already in that river. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And the remedy is that, that the property is being inspected by DeKalb County inspectors every single day. Every day they are out there walking this property. They were there yesterday. I don't know if they were there today yet, Alan. Have they been there today yet? Not yet today as far as we know, but we don't have our phones. So they might have been. Your Honor, there is, this is 85 acres. There is no motivation on APF to go clear cut these trees. There's no motivation whatsoever. And more importantly, not only is it completely irresponsible, it's clearly illegal. We would not only have a stop work order issued the next day, but there would be tickets and fines out people's ears if that happened. And I stand here and submit to you today, that is not the intention of APF nor the city of Atlanta. We have a plan. We're going to stick to that plan. I'll tell you another remedy. Are, are daily inspections required or is this gratuitous? I don't know the answer to that. I just know it's happening. Don't you think that would be important? Because again, they're, they're I mean, Mr. Schwartz, they're, they're sort of in a, a danger zone. I mean, they've got the appeal. But if you went through there, you, I think you used the term clear cut. They, you can just flatten everything right now. Um, somebody, unless someone's watching your plan. Let me tell you what would happen if that happened also. A couple of other things occurred to me. Number one, the, the, there are, um, let's call them licensees that all have a right as engineers to, to develop these plans and to develop these development plans and to, and, to, and to engineer the site and the erosion center control plan. They are licensed by the state. If they participate in skipping to the end of their erosion center control plan, they will lose their license just as sure as I'm standing here. Nobody, nobody has the motivation to, to, take a, to make a move like that. It would, be, it would be professional suicide to do that. But don't take my word for it, Judge. There's no way that the county would allow us to do that. And I, and I, and I submit to the court. So you're saying the county is going to be the watchdog, but you're unsure as to whether they're expecting the property to date. Yes, they're the watchdog. I don't know if they are, you asked me if they're required to inspect the property daily, and I don't know the answer to that. But I do know that before we make another move, any step forward in the development progress, we have to get their permission. So currently there is no clearing uh, going on, is that true? That is correct. Okay. That's the facts. All right. So Judge, I, I, I want to, I appreciate your question because I want to tell you what you're interested in knowing. I, I want to also bring the court's attention back to the overlay that you identified, which is in fact the most important part of the equation today, and that is the balancing of the harms. And I'd like to go to Exhibit 1 and tell your honor a story about December 14th. 
And I, I've also asked you a few questions, but I'll give you about five more minutes. I think that would be sufficient. It, it, it won't, but I'll do my best. <laughs> Uh, it could, if I could have 10, Judge, I just want to get through the, I want to get through some of these things. So that, see how you're looking at set. Yes, sir. Thank you, Judge. Exhibit one is a story of December 14th. One of these peaceful protesters that had been living in this forest that you saw on your screen decided to take out a, an assault rifle and uh, head towards a line of DeKalb police officers with this assault rifle. She raised it and aimed it at those police officers and thank God, after they yelled at her for a while, she put it down keep going through the slides, and she was subsequently arrested as a result of this peaceful protesting. I'll tell you another story, Judge. On July 30th, Exhibit 2, um, a property owner in the area brought his vehicle carrying an excavator onto the property adjacent to the subject property to do some land work on his property, not ours. This is what happened to his truck. His truck, he, he was met by some of these peaceful protesters that are at all costs objecting to the development of this project. His truck was vandalized. It was later uh, burned to a crisp, dismantled, and you can see in the, in the documents I've provided you um, what the sentiment is with respect to these protests. I'm going to tell you how, what. How do you create a nexus to these uh, protest I, activities to this legal standard? Yes, sir, I'm getting there. I promise. I promise. Okay. I promise. You, you're, you're right on with me. One more example, Judge, um, Exhibit 3, we'll, we'll skip Exhibit 3, but basically it, it is a video of one of the news stories, of one of these channels, I'm sure, of a guy from Paulding County that just was driving by in his truck, saw some scrap metal he wanted to get and harvest, and the same peaceful protesters threw Molotov cocktails at him while he was driving and set his truck on fire. He had to get up and run. That, the nexus is that the protesters and the I'm going to save my adjectives, but the protesters that have been putting life and limb at risk and living in these forests, opposing this project, have promised a week of action and a gathering in Atlanta to protest what they call Cop City if it is, if it is, if it is allowed to continue to go forward. The last time, the last three times that these folks promised to have a gathering in Atlanta we're in May of 22, and Your Honor looks at Exhibit 5, and you can see a timeline of all of the lawlessness and violence that took place in May of 22. So they call for a convergence, and people come from around the country, and they go into that forest, and they break laws, break bones, break necks, have weapons, throw Molotov cocktails, assault and attack people that want to stop them. That is a certainty if this project stops. That's the nexus because they promised to do that in May, and you can see what happened in May. They promised again in July, said, come on back to Atlanta, we need to stop Cop City, and in July, um, you've got examples of the, the truck that we just showed you that was being destroyed. They called for action again in January. Skip to uh, exhibit, the, the exhibit of the, of the riots. On January 18th, you've read it in the paper, there was a, quote, peaceful protester living in these woods. That peaceful protester had a gun. When the joint task force of local law enforcement went to clear that encampment, which was this autonomous zone in one of these pieces of property, not a public park, that they simply took over. In that encampment, we finally had to go down and get control of this property and started to move those people out. This guy had a gun. He shot a Georgia State trooper in the stomach and return fire ended his life. You're talking about balancing that level of lawlessness, violence, and certainty of harm against maybe, maybe, some silt running off site into the creek. That's the nexus. Well, and let, me, let me go back to the, the one question you were unable to answer. Do you believe that the DeKalb County authorities would be willing to make daily inspections of this property such that the status quo can be maintained until this appeal is resolved, such that you've represented your client is not going to do anything, but that there's an, a level of assurance that nothing is happening to create additional sales. Not only, I'm going to go out a little bit on a limb before I talk to my client, but not only would I be willing to, let's say, accept such a requirement, I wouldn't be surprised if we would pay for those inspections. 
We don't have anything to hide, Judge. In fact, this is what I tell my clients. I represent national builders all over the country. This is what I tell them. If you want to stay out of the crosshairs of the local governing authority, you've got to communicate with them so that when Jimmy steps onto the site and says, you need to fix that sill fence, you call Bobby and fix the sill fence. Because if you don't, you get citations, you get stop work orders, and if you slow down the projects and you're trying to sell houses, you lose money. So all the motivation is to cooperate with the local governing authority, and the short answer to your question is yes. We would be glad to submit to daily inspections by DeKalb County or some third-party inspector, which lots of developers use. They hire a third-party inspector that do nothing but analyze and, and inspect whether the safeguards are in place. Now, I, let me ask you a more difficult question, as I think you're almost at your time. Yes, sir. During the pendency of this appeal, Tell me about your anticipated actions. Are you in a stand down posture until this uh, appeal is resolved or tell me where you are? No, Judge, we're not. We're not in a stand down posture. The, the DeKalb, DeKalb County has made the decision by not issuing us a stop work order that their issuance of the LDP corroborated now three times by e, EPD was the right decision. And as a result, the, the, the corollary to that is that they have not issued a stop work order because it's not required. We all we agree with the county in that regard. And it is further endorsement that we can continue to develop the project. But I understand the court's concern. And so all I can tell you is that A, we would submit to the, to the inspections, and B, that the plan for developing that property, the horizontal development of the property, is staged pursuant to county regulations the state regulations plus four additional regulations plus the goal of not getting sued for having too much runoff. All of those things line up in the same direction to make sure that we are responsible in the development of this 85 acres. So the daily inspections will be referenced to the silt, uh, silt runoff, correct? Uh, you, you can call, your honor can call it um, uh, Erosion sediment control inspections would be probably the most accurate, or they would call it BMP inspections, best management practices. And that's things like making sure that the, that the silt fences are clear, making sure that the rocks that are called riprap rocks that slow down the flow of water are installed, making sure that you don't cut more trees until you have the detention pond in the ground. I mean, these are the things that happen in the state and the phases of development that you don't do the next one until you've done the first one. So for example, you don't want to have all this exposed clay and start cutting and moving dirt until you have all of those things really buttoned up. Because you don't want the silt to leave the site if you can avoid it. Okay. All right, I think you uh, are now at your time. I've got your best authority on point. So again, uh, Mr. Schwartz, Mr. Bloom, well argued. This is what I would ask at this time. Uh, this is well briefed, no need for rebuttal. This is more interpretive. You, you guys have, have uh, briefed as well. And you've both done a great job on behalf of your client. If you could prepare proposed orders and submit those to Mr. Smith via Microsoft Word, uh, I'll take the proposed orders up and uh, issue a ruling uh, at the appropriate time as quickly as possible. I believe I understand the legal issue and uh, thank you for uh, addressing the issue raised in my questions because I think that captures the essence of what we're here to talk about. Your Honor, by when, we, we can have a proposed order due tomorrow. I, I would, I, I am not in the business of, of giving homework to a, to a sitting Superior Court judge. However, the next slides I was going to show the court are slides that are calling for a week of action here in Atlanta, the week of February, next week. Next week. A week of action for next week here in Atlanta to take back the forest. And my fear, Your Honor, is, again, I'm not trying to hurry Your Honor along, but my fear is a very real fear that irreparable harm and injury is going to come if we don't have a decision soon enough to be able to do whatever needs to be done from there. I can promise you, Mr. Bloom, that I will act with all due diligence, and, I, and you can ask my colleagues, I'm one of the late workers here. So I will act with all due diligence, and this is a top priority. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be in recess.